All right, so moving on then to lecture number seven uh, in Rudolf Steiner's uh, commentary on the Gospel of Luke. Um, he starts by rewinding a bit and saying, so now we have this boy, the Nathan Jesus boy, um, who at the age of 12 then receives the transmigration of the Solomon ego into his body, uh, who had been living incarnate in the Solomon boy, now at the age of 12 tra transmigrates uh, when his astral body has ripened. And Steiner points out that uh, in most people, the astral body does not come to full maturity until puberty, right around the age of 14, uh, and it has a seven-year cycle. So he goes back and he says, recall that my model, every seven years, you have the development of another one of these uh, sheaths, well, let's say, uh, the etheric sheath for the first seven years of the child is working on the physical body. Then at the age of seven, with the change of the teeth, the etheric sheath falls away and the etheric body is born and can be used for other things, such as intellectual development and so forth. And then at the age of 14, the astral sheath falls away and then it too now can come into mature development. And then at the age of 21, the sentient soul is developed. And at the age of 28, the intellectual or mind soul comes into full maturity. And then at 35, finally, the consciousness soul comes into full maturity. And those are how the faculties develop. And Steiner says, don't be so pedantic in thinking uh, that you can nail this down precisely to 7, 14. Uh, th these are just approximations. It's a little different for everyone. But, but due to the climate, he says, uh, of Palestine, um, I suppose the, these individuals achieve uh, puberty earlier. The astral body was ready to go in this Nathan Jesus at the age of 12. And this is why then um, the Solomon boy had uh, uh, was a was about to die, the Zarathustra ego left him, then, then the boy dies, the Zarathustra ego leaves him after that ego has gone and transmigrated into the Nathan child. And then at the age of 30, then, um, the Christ being descends down into the Nathan boy at the moment of baptism by John. And now Steiner says that uh, baptism in those days was a little different uh, than it is today. It was apparently much more harsh and involved in actual near drowning. Uh, he says that the, the, the John would have submerged the, the Jesus boy down beneath the water completely um, to the point where there was might have been a fear of drowning. He, he says this is how baptism was done back in these days. And um, as many accounts of near-death experiences have, have revealed that people who are on the point of drowning or have drowned, but they come back, um, have their life review. They feel as though they have parted from their physical body and gone into another world, the astral plane, of course, and uh, seen another reality. They might have a brief uh, life review. And so he says, what would have happened then? It would be the temporary separation of the Nathan boy's um, etheric body from the physical body. And during that moment of separation, the Christ being would have come down to unite at that point with the etheric body and then returned back into the physical body as the boy then came up. So the question then becomes, where did the Zarathustra ego go? Since now that has been displaced, and remember that um, a portion of Adam's etheric body that was pre-fall had been preserved and used as a provisional ego for this Nathan Jesus. That would have been displaced by the Zarathustra ego then, uh, which would have transmigrated at the age of 12, and then at the age of 30 then, it's displaced by the descent of the Christ being. And then, so what happens with the Zarathustra ego is that it goes on to the other side. Now, um, he, um, Steiner says that, recall that the Mary to whom the Annunciation appears in the Luke Gospel, the mother of the Nathan boy, uh, died not too long after. And when her um, soul transmigrated, or let's say moved into the astral plane, she took with her, actually, according to Steiner, the etheric body of the Solomon boy. Um, because it was worth preserving because it had been in for 12 years into interactive uh, contact with the ego of Zarathustra, a very highly developed spiritual individuality. And so it wouldn't be one of these ast ast uh, etheric bodies like uh, Joe Sixpack on the street that is just disposable. It would have been preserved. So he says that the Mary individuality, who was the mother of the Nathan boy when she died, then preserved that so that when... Uh, the Nathan boy turns 30 and the Christ being comes down and the Zarathustra ego is displaced. It goes into the astral plane and it unites with that etheric body of the Solomon boy, uh, with which it had been united in, in a physical body, but now that boy's long since dead. And so when it unites, Stenner 
has this bizarre idea um, where he says that, so what happens is that um, he builds himself a new physical body uh, together with this etheric body of the Solomon boy. And this physical body, unlike the Christ being who incarnated only once, uh, reincarnates over and over again. And he calls it the master Jesus. Now, I don't know what the fuck this means. He, does, he doesn't elaborate on it, but he just says, so this is the master Jesus that transmigrates from lifetime to lifetime in the subsequent 2,000 years of Christian history. It sounds a little like the paraclete that, that John speaks of, actually, in the John Gospel, who comes down and helps those individuals who are struggling to understand uh, the Golgotha event uh, and helps them understand uh, the significance of it. Um, but he doesn't say who the subsequent incarnations are. Uh, maybe he will later. Uh, so that's the fate of the Zarathustra ego when it unites with the Solomon boy's etheric body and then proceeds its, on its path of reincarnations to help people understand uh, Christianity. So now, um, so he says then, who was this Christ being then that united with the etheric body of the Nathan Jesus? And he says that um, in the astral plane, uh, and the Buddha was one of these, there's a sort of lodge, this is how it's translated, I don't know if that's the German word, but there's a sort of lodge in which there are these 12 spiritual beings um, he calls them bodhisattvas. And the Buddha was one of these 12 spiritual beings who incarnate, whose task is to incarnate every so often through, spirit, through the spiritual evolution of humanity uh, to guide uh, and shepherd humanity along, uh, performing different functions. And the Buddha's task was to incarnate um, as his final incarnation, uh, specifically to teach men the religion of love and compassion and to create... Uh, love and compassion within them, within their souls. That was his mission. But he says now they, uh, the, the 13th, there's a 13th individuality, just as we have the 12 disciples, I suppose, and, and Christ. Here again, it's Christ who is uh, the sun being, who when the earth, uh, during a previous cosmic epoch, when the earth separated from the sun, the sun took with it uh, a number of spiritual beings of whom the highest was the Christ being. And this is the being who was... Uh, regarded as Ahura Mazda by Zoroaster, and he says by the Hindus as Vishvakarman, which I don't understand because Vishvakarman isn't a sun god. Vishvakarman is the ancient Vedic architect who builds all the weapons and all the palaces for all the great heroes and the gods and so forth, but be that as it may. Uh, so this is who the Christ being is. It's the 13th being that sort of sits in the middle uh, with the periphery around which these other 12 bodhisattvas he is the actual wisdom of the sun, which radiates to them and sends them forth on cosmic missions as his emissaries uh, to pave the way for various phases of his teaching. Vishvakarman in the uh, Indian epoch is the first post-Atlantean epoch. Ahura Mazda is the second epoch and, and so on down to the Christ event. So that's who the Christ being was in essence. Now then Steiner wants to ask, so why didn't this event happen sooner in Earth evolution than it did? Why did it take so long for this sun being to incarnate? Because uh, it only happens once in his mythology on the Earth. And he says that the reason for this is because we have to look back at the Lemurian Epoch with uh, the fall there that happened that's recorded in the book of Genesis. Uh, so we have the fall in which uh, the human astral body became infected by Luciferic beings. These are always rebellious beings who don't behave and don't follow the rules. And they had not developed further than they had on Old Moon. So they're sort of spiritual laggards. But they infected the astral body and of course led to the temptation and the fall in the garden. Um, they're always these sort of satanic beings. But the human etheric body remained unaffected uh, and uninfluenced by any of these kinds of spiritual beings. And Steiner says this is an important thing that the etheric body was sort of held back from being infected by these beings because humans would not have been able to evolve spiritually the way that they did if that had happened. Uh, one of the positive things that the Luciferic beings give, give to the human being, of course, was free will. Uh, the decision to choose to sin or not to sin, uh, to fall or not to fall. So we have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the fall. But then there's that second tree. Keep the second tree in mind, which is withheld from the grasp of the human uh, the, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree of immortal life. Um, so in order to prevent that from happening, they're exiled from the garden. So Steiner wants to get at this deal with the etheric body and the relationship to the second tree. And he says for that, the etheric body is connected to a larger world of four different types of ethers that each one of which has evolved over time through his uh, cosmogony. 
and uh, there are two higher ethers and two lower ethers and the two higher ethers are the life ether and the sound ether um, so the and the life ether is connected in the human mind to meaning the german word is zin s-i-n-n -N, to meaning whereas the next ether down uh, the sound ether which is um, the music of the, the spheres um, which lies behind all physical sound that we hear uh, we only hear the outer shell of it uh, but beneath it is this uh, life fostering uh, morphogenetic sound that vibrates through all creation perhaps this is what uh, in Indian yoga mantras tap into this the use of mantras especially om uh, taps into this the sound ether uh, but Steiner says that this has to do with the faculty of thinking so meaning and thinking are higher than the lower two ethers which have to do with feeling and willing um, the lowest ether is the fire ether and this has to do with willing and the fire ether is that which is related in the physical body to the temperature the warm bloodedness uh, the blood he says carries the will um, and it's an individualistic thing a man's will is something that has to do with him uniquely he makes his own decisions through freedom of the will and this is the fire ether but the light ether uh, is connected with feelings and becomes visible to clairvoyant perceptions as the aura um, we have this new age idea of course that's always I can see your aura your aura is a different color um, I would laugh at it except that I've actually seen a man's aura and once when I overdosed on psychedelic mushrooms uh, so I, I realized that this isn't a new age cliche it's an actual fact but you can see the feelings in the light ether in a man's aura in a person's aura uh, they have different colors the different feelings have different colors the the darker <clears throat> heavier emotions which in Sankhya philosophy would have been ra rajas guna would be <clears throat> would, would appear as red the fiery passionate emotions would appear as red uh, the more pleasant um, quiet emotions would appear as green uh, and so forth so they all have different the different colors in the light ether all have different connections to feeling so then these two e uh, ethers were made available by the spiritual beings for our own use for the human use on an individual basis both willing and feeling are individualized um, I feel this I feel that I will this I will that but the realm of thinking on the other hand if we ascend up to the two upper ethers with regard to the realm of thinking that's a universal property of the human species it's not something that is an individual property it's not an individual thing and so thinking and also meaning which is the within let's say of thinking um, so we have thinking then being connected with the sound ether and it's within is of course the life ether that it shapes morphogenetically and has to do with meaning these were out of the reach of the human being this is what was held behind as the second tree in the garden the tree of immortal life which was withheld from the grasp of the human being until the time was right uh, through the process of his spiritual maturation <clears throat> when the sun being the Christ being would come down as the incarnation of the logos the word that is to say of these upper two ethers thinking and meaning this is the cosmic word that the Christ being as the Sun God incarnates and finally brings down to the earth to finally become within reach of the individual human grasp um, and converse an individuality upon uh, one's thinking uh, that is totally separate from your descent from this or that particular tribe and so this is what Steiner says about why the event had to take place when it did all these preparations had to be made all the different subtle bodies in the Nathan Jesus and the Solomon Jesus all these things had to go through long long preparations to get to the point where in a certain sense the Sun could reunite with the earth through the descent of the Christ being from the Sun remember in Steiner's cosmology that the earth and the Sun had been one together and that the earth and Sun had separated uh, and the Christ being had withdrawn to the Sun sphere and so it's not till the mystery of Golgotha that the earth and Sun are reunited once again with the descent of the word made flesh and so that's lecture number seven